So, in this video, we're going to discuss the incredibly important phenomenon of standing waves. Now, standing waves occur when you have a finite length of medium, such as this wave machine here, and we get reflections at both ends of the machine. Now, as we've seen earlier, the reflection, uh, the type of reflection we get depends on the conditions at this boundary. If I have a clamped boundary, then the reflected wave has a phase change of pi, and if I have an open boundary, then there's no phase change in the reflection, and this is obviously going to have an impact on this phenomenon of standing waves. So to start with, let's have a look at the maths behind standing waves and see what results when we apply these boundary conditions to both ends of the medium. So to start the discussion of standing waves, let's consider a wave on a string. So the displacement of the string as a function of position on the string in time is given by this for a positive traveling wave. And here we're using the implied real notation. So now to the string. So let's assume we have a boundary here, and then we have a length of string here, and then we have a second boundary, and the length of string between the boundaries is capital L. And these are both going to be closed boundaries, so we have a zero displacement boundary condition. The string cannot be displaced at the boundary. So if we look at this, what we're going to have is, supposing I start with a positive going wave, and it's traveling in the positive x direction. It's then going to reflect at this boundary, and as we've seen, reflection at a boundary gives us a phase change of pi. So now we've got a negative going wave, but it's going to have the opposite sign. So if I started with a positive pulse, I have a negative pulse, just like we saw before. This is now traveling in the negative x direction until it gets to the next boundary, where it also has a reflection with a phase change of pi, and it becomes a positive going pulse with a positive uh, um, upwards displacement, if we're assuming it's a wave pulse. So that means that our net displacement for the string is going to consist of waves traveling in the positive x direction plus waves traveling in the negative x direction. We've got both. But the waves traveling in the negative x direction will have the opposite sign. This is a phase change of, of pi, and so e to the i pi is equal to minus 1, and so that's why we have this minus sign in here for the negative going waves. Okay, so what does that mean our net displacement is going to be? Well, y is a function of x and t is equal to a e to the i, and we've got kx plus phi, so that's a constant factor in both these terms, and that leaves me with e to the minus i omega t minus e to the i omega t. Okay, so how does this evaluate? Well, I'm going to use a little bit of shorthand here. This, remember, is cos minus i sine of omega t, and this is cos plus i sine of omega t. So I've got cosine minus cosine, so these two terms are going to cancel. And then I've got minus i times sine minus i times sine of omega t. So I'm going to have minus 2i omega t. So this is going to give me minus 2ai e to the i kx plus phi times, and now it's going to be the sine of omega t. Okay, so now, remember, I'm using the implied real notation. So I want the real part of this expression here. Now, this, remember, is going to be i times the cosine plus i times the sine. So here, the imaginary part is now going to be the cosine term because I have this additional i out in the front. And so the real part of this is going to be minus sine, right? Because I've got i times i, so it's going to be minus sine of this. So now my displacement as a function of position and time is going to be equal to, well, I've got a minus sign here multiplied by this minus sign, so that cancels. So I'm going to have 2a, and now I've got sine of kx plus phi times the sine of omega t. So this is my expression for the displacement of the string as a function of position and time. So now let's apply our boundary conditions. 
So here's our displacement as a function of position and time, and here's our string of length L, and we have these two boundary conditions because these are closed boundaries that there's zero displacement at either end of the string. Okay, so let's apply the first boundary condition. So x, when x is zero, y must be zero, and so what that means is that 2a times the sine of kx, which is zero, so we don't put anything here, times plus phi, so we're just left with phi here, times the sine of omega t must be zero. Well, this varies with time, and while it might be zero at a particular instant in time, in which case the displacement of the string is zero everywhere, it's generally not zero. So our condition here is that the sine of phi must be equal to zero, and that's only going to be true when phi is equal to zero. So we've got our first condition. We know that the constant phase phi must be zero. Okay, so next boundary condition is that when x is equal to capital L, y is also equal to zero. Okay, so what does that give us? Well, that gives us that 2a times the sine of k times x, which is now k times big L, times the sine of omega t must be equal to zero. But again, this is generally not zero, and so we must have that this is equal to zero. So when is the sine of k times L going to be equal to zero? Well, that's when k times L is either going to be zero itself. Well, that's not possible because though this is the wave number. The only time the wave number is zero is if the wavelength is infinite, or the alternative is we have zero length of string, in which case, well, what are we doing? So when is k times L zero, uh, 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 sine of k times L zero other than when one of these two things is zero? Well, if k times L is equal to pi, sine of pi is zero. 2 pi, sine of 2 pi is 0, 3 pi, in fact, any integer number of pi. So we have multiple possible solutions here, where n here is any integer, um, and that's equal to 1, 2, um, 3, and so on, right? So not 0, but 1, 2, 3, and, and so on. So that means, if let's write out our wave number now. Well, our wave number is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. Multiply that by the length of string, and that's equal to n times pi. Well, I can cancel the pi's, and I can rearrange this so that my wavelength here for the string is equal to, well, what am I going to have? I'm going to have 2L divided by n which means that my wavelength is going to be allowed to be 2L when n is, n is 1. We can have uh, L when n is 2. We can have 2 thirds L when n is 3. We can have a half L when n is 4, and so on and so forth. So I've now, with my standing wave, restricted myself to only having certain fixed wavelengths allowed. And only these wavelengths will obey these two boundary conditions. Any other wavelength will not obey those boundary conditions and is not allowed. Now, this also has consequences for the frequency. Remember that our phase velocity is equal to the frequency times lambda. So that means that our frequency is just c divided by lambda. And so our frequency now is going to be n times c divided by 2L. So I've got fixed values for frequency that com come from this fixed expression for wavelength. Now, of course, the phase velocity here depends on the physical characteristics of the system, the tens and tension and the mass per unit length of the string. So by changing these quantities, I can change the allowed frequencies. The wavelengths are constrained by the length of the string. These are the things that are constrained by these boundary conditions here. And the frequency, although it's quantized, can only have certain values, is quantized you know, in relationship to this phase velocity, and the phase velocity depends on the physical characteristics of the system. Now, I said the word quantize there. It's not going to come as a shock. This is the physics behind why things like an electron only has fixed energy levels in an atom, and that's something we'll discuss later. So now that we've and, you know, come up with our expression for standing waves on a string, what do these standing waves look like? Well. This is the longest wavelength, which means the lowest frequency. And this is what we call 
the fundamental mode of vibration. So the fundamental mode is the one associated with the longest possible wavelength for the whatever system is undergoing standing waves. Now, as we increase, so this is the case where n is equal to 1. Well, you can see it here. Here we go to n equals 2, and we can see now that our wavelength, lambda, would be equal to the length of string. And what this means is that at any instant in time, we end up with a full sine wave being contained on the string. Now, of course, remember that our displacement as a function of x and time was proportional to sine of omega t. So over time, this is going to oscillate up and down. It was multiplied by our sine wave as a function of k times x, but the omega t part means that over time, this is going to oscillate up and down. So what this means is, is that points in our sine, so this is also, we've got a sine of k times x here. So at points where our sine of k times x is 0, then it doesn't matter what the value of sine omega t is, we're always going to get 0, and so we always get 0 displacement. And where we get a 0 displacement, we call this a node. Now, where the sine of k times x is equal to 1, this is where, when we multiply it by sine of omega t, we're going to get a huge amplitude, or the largest possible amplitude, displacement. And so this is the opposite of where we have 0 displacement, and since it's the opposite, we call it an antinode. Now, one of the very important things to notice is that, of course, because we're talking about a string with two closed boundaries, we always have a node on either end. That was our boundary condition, that we had zero displacement at either end of the string. So we always get zero displacement at the ends for closed boundaries. So as you can see, as we increase the number here, n equals 3, n equals 4, the n here corresponds actually to the number of antinodes in the string, and each of these antinodes is separated by a node in between. Now, as we look at this, since the solid blue line shows us the displacement of the string at one instance in time, what we can see is that the displacement between two adjacent nodes is equal to half a wavelength. Right? So the displacement between two adjacent nodes is equal to half a wavelength, and of course we have an antinode exactly halfway in between, and so the displacement between a node and an antinode is quarter of a wavelength. So now we've seen the static picture, we've introduced the vocabulary to describe it, let's have a look at an animation of a standing wave on a string. So here you can see the first four modes of vibration for a string of fixed length. So as you can see, as the frequency increases, the number of nodes, so that's the positions where the zero displacement also increases, but for all the modes of vibration, the displacement is always zero at the ends of the string, and that's because we have two closed boundaries. So here we have a string that's under tension, and there's a weight on the far end that's keeping it uh, under a fixed tension. And it's attached here in this box to a vibration device that will move it up and down um, at a high speed. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this string vibrating, and we're going to alter the frequency of the vibrations, and you will see a standing wave appear on this string. And as we increase the frequency, you will see that the number of nodes and antinodes increase as we go to higher and higher frequencies. Now, this is a string that's clamped at both ends. It has a node at that end, and it will have a node at this end. And so you'll see what we have the standing waves for a string with two clamped ends. So what we have here is we have the system tuned to the fundamental frequency. So there's a node at this end, a node at the far end. It's a little bit unstable because a string, of course, has got two directions it can vibrate in. It can vibrate up and down and left and right. And we'll be talking about that more when we discuss light waves. So there is a little bit of instability here, plus the motor is a mechanical system and doesn't always have a very stable uh, uh, frequency. So this is the fundamental mode. I'm now I'm going to go up and we're going to find the higher harmonics.
So this now is the first harmonic. You can see that there is a node right in the center here where the amplitude of vibration is almost zero. Again, it's not a perfect system, so it's not perfectly zero. Let's go up and look for a higher frequency node. And there we have the next harmonic. There are two nodes now in the center, and we'll try for the next one. I don't know whether we'll be able to go that fast. We'll see. And there we have the next mode there. And you can see that we've got three nodes in the center. Now I'm going to take it back to the uh, one below that. So there we are, we have a node here and a node over there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the other end and I'm going to change the tension. And what you'll see is that when I change the tension in the string, we lose resonance. So the standing wave depends not only on the length of the string, but it also depends on the tension that the string is under. And so there I've increased the tension and you can see the resonance goes away. If I relax the tension, we go back to having our standing wave. If I reduce the tension, the same thing happens. So this is why if you increase the tension in the string of something like a violin, you will end up with a change in the pitch of the violin. Um, all a violin does is vibrates the string at the resonant frequencies. It's going to be a combination of resonant frequencies, which is what gives you the characteristic sound of a violin. But by altering the tension in the string, you alter the frequency of the standing wave. You do not alter the wavelength. The wavelength, of course, is fixed, but with the change in the tension, you can change the frequency. Now, what you're seeing here is the use of a strobe light to effectively slow the string down. So what you actually see is you only see the string when there's a flash, and that flash is happening several times a second, and so you see the string move slowly, even though in between the flashes, the string may make one, two, or even more uh, oscillations. So what this allows you to see is that the string is oscillating and if you look carefully you can see there are certain nodes in the string where there is no oscillation and other areas where the amplitude is large. So now we've had a look at standing waves on strings. Let's have a look at a different type of standing wave. And so now we're going to use a sound wave in a pipe. Oops. And we're going to start with two open ends. So this is different from the case where we had two closed ends. At an open end, we have a medium that is free to vibrate. Because the pressure out here is going to remain constant. It's only the pressure in the pipe uh, that is allowed to vary. And so our acoustic or st sound wave is going to have an antinode at the end. Because the air here is very free to vibrate. There's nothing stopping it vibrating. So we have an antinode here. Similarly, at the other end of the pipe, we have an antinode. Now, as we saw with the string, the minimum number of nodes that we can put in between two antinodes is one. So for the n equals 1 case here, we're going to have one node in the middle. And as we discussed for a string, the distance between an antinode and a node is quarter of a wavelength. And so for the n equals 1 case, where we've got a pipe with two open ends, then we're going to have that the wavelength here is equal to twice the length of the pipe. Now, for the n equals 2 case here, we can put in two antinodes, and again we have to add in now a third, uh, sorry, two nodes in between the two antinodes at the end. Remember, we're fixed uh, by having antinodes at the end because of the open end. And now we can put in two nodes, and of course, between those two nodes, we must have a single antinode. And so now the you know, the length of the pipe is equal to the wavelength. So lambda is equal to L. 
Now, if we go to n equals 3 by extension, we're going to have three nodes in here. We're going to have two antinodes. And so now what we're going to get is we're going to have that the um, we're going to have three uh, three half wavelengths equal the pipe. And so therefore the wavelength here is going to be two thirds the length of the pipe and so on. And so by extrapolating this, we're finding that we're getting the same wavelengths that we had for the string with the two closed boundaries. And we find that the wavelength is constrained to be 2L over N, where N is equal to 1, 2, and so on. So the frequency, again, is just C divided by the wavelength. So again, we have N times C over um, 2L. And so we end up with the same allowed frequencies and the same allowed wavelengths as we had for a string. But we can do something different with a pipe. Supposing we take one of these ends now and we close it off. So let's have a look what happens when we have an open end and a closed end for a pipe. So now we have the system here where we've got the same pipe, but we've closed one end of it. So we've got a closed end here, and we've got an open end here. Now at the closed end, the air molecules cannot vibrate. They cannot move at all because they're right up against this wall, and so we have to have a node here. The open end, again, the molecules are very free to vibrate, so we have an antinode. So because we've got a node at one end and an antinode at the other, we don't need anything in between them. In the, in the longest wavelength case, there's no node or antinode in between them. We can put them adjacent. We can put a node adjacent to an antinode. So this means that the wavelength, that the length of the pipe here, L is equal to lambda over 4. And so that means that lambda is equal to 4 times the length of the pipe. So we can fit a wavelength 4 times longer than the pipe into this pipe. So that's a huge wavelength. Next, the minimum number of nodes and antinodes we can put in is we can add in an extra pair. We've got to put in them in a pair. So we have an antinode and a node. And that means we get half a wavelength between one node at the end to the next node. And then we have a quarter of a wavelength between that node and the next antinode. So that means that the length of the pipe now is equal to 3 lambda over 4. And so that means that lambda is equal to 4 um, L over 3. So this is still longer than the length of the pipe now, but it's a lot closer to the length of the pipe. So in general, what we're going to find is that the length of the pipe is going to be equal to, well, as you can see here, we went from 1 lambda over 4 to 3 lambda over 4. Next, it's going to be 5 lambda over 4, then 7 lambda over 4. So what we've got is we've got 2n minus 1 times lambda over 4, where n is just as we did for the um, all the cases here, n goes from 1 to 2 to 3 and so on. We're not having allowing n to be 0. So what this means is that our wavelength for these allowed standing waves is going to be now, well, all we do is we rearrange this, and so it's equal to 4L over 2n minus 1. So these are our allowed wavelengths. And then, of course, our frequencies are just c divided by the wavelength. So it's just c uh, times 1 over this. And so our allowed frequencies are going to be 2n minus 1 times c divided by 4l. So again, we can use this counting of nodes and antinodes to figure out the allowed wavelengths in a pipe that is open at one end and closed at the other. So here we can see an animation of waves on a fixed length of string, but now with two open boundaries. So this is the same condition as we were talking about with the pipe. It's just a little bit easier to visualize it with a string to start with. So you'll notice that the frequencies are, in fact, exactly the same as we had before for the closed uh, boundaries. The difference is now is that we have an antinode at the ends of the string. 
Now here, we've transitioned to a simulation of the longitudinal wave in a pipe, again with two open ends. And you can see that the little blue dots representing the air molecules have a very large amplitude vibration at either end of the pipe. And for the fundamental mode, the lowest frequency mode at the top of the screen, you can see that there is a single node in the middle and the air molecules bunch together and separate from that position. For the next highest mode, you can see that there are two nodes, and it appears that the air molecules first of all bunch at one of the nodes, and then bunch at the other node. And so this is, again, a slight difference in the longitudinal wave is that it visualizes a little bit differently, but you can still see that there are very clearly two nodes for the next highest frequency, and you still have the two antinodes at the end where there is a large vibrational amplitude. So what we've got here to demonstrate standing waves in a tube using sound waves is something called the Kunst tube. And that's a word you've got to be very careful when you pronounce it. It was a tube that was first invented in the late 1800s by a German physicist by the name Kunst. That's K-U-N-D-T. And what it consists of is a tube with little fine grains of cork uh, dust in it and we have a speaker at this end and it's attached to a variable frequency generator so we can generate a variety of sound frequencies and when we reach a resonant frequency the little grains of cork will vibrate backwards and forwards and so we can see where we have a node where there's no movement of the cork and an antinode where there's a large amount of movement of the cork. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn this on and we'll zoom in and you can have a look and see what happens when we reach a resonant frequency. And then we can measure the length of the tube here using this ruler and we can get the approximate frequency of the sound that's causing it to resonate from the uh, frequency generator and that will allow us to determine the speed of sound in air. So here we have the tube, and you can see in the bottom of it, here there is the cork dust that's resting on the bottom. Now, the speaker is currently set to generate a frequency well below that of the fundamental mode of this tube. And what I'm going to do in a minute is increase the frequency that the speaker is generating until you see the cork dust at the bottom start to vibrate. Now, one of the things you will notice when I do this is that there are become fine lines appear in the cork dust, and these lines are about half a centimeter apart. This separation is caused not by the fundamental mode of the standing wave or a higher harmonic. It's actually caused because the molecules of the air are vibrating at a different rate to the cork dust. And the result is that little vortices of air form around the cork dust and the, these vortices repel and they produce an equal spacing of the cork dust. And this effect was first discovered in 1891 by Koenig who wrote papers in the Annalen der Physik to explain the phenomenon and these were later corrected with the uh, um, more precise vortex explanation in the 1932 in the proceedings of the Royal Society. So let's go through the resonance. So you can see the dust is now starting to vibrate. And you can see the striations uh, that were predicted by Koenig appear. And there we are at roughly the resonant frequency of the tube, a little bit over 200 hertz. So you can see the cork is vibrating in the center of the tube and to either end there is no motion of the cork and that is where we have the two nodes, one at each end and the antinode in the middle. Now if we measure the length of the tube we get a distance of roughly 
just over 80 centimeters let's call it 81 centimeters and we have a frequency of um, oscillation from the speaker we have a frequency of vibration of well 200 205 maybe 210 hertz so if we multi so remember that the tube is half of one wavelength so if the tube is length 81 centimeters then the wavelength that we have vibrating in there is 1.62 meters if we multiply that by the frequency that we have which is just over 200 hertz we get a number that is roughly consistent with the speed of sound in air which is about 340 meters per second at room temperature so within some generous errors we've got a result that's consistent for the speed of sound in air so here we have the tube at the fundamental mode of vibration and we're going to increase the frequency now to get to the next harmonic now if you look at the equation we derived earlier for the allowed wavelengths you should be able to predict the frequency at which the next standing wave will be excited so let's increase the frequency and see if you got your prediction correct And so there we are, we're now at the first harmonic above the fundamental frequency and as you can see in the center here there is a node now, the cork dust there is not moving at all, you can see it vibrating a lot here and you can see it vibrating a lot here, so we have a node, an antinode, a node, an antinode and a node at the end. And so this is the first harmonic above the fundamental frequency and it has occurred at just over 400 hertz and this was consistent with what we, our formula that we first derived because now we have one whole wavelength contained in the tube so one whole wavelength is 81 centimeters which means that now the frequency must be twice what it was before and so we went from 200 or just over 200 to just over 400 Hertz so let's increase it again and see if we can get to the second harmonic and here we are now at the second harmonic the third vibration mode of the tube we've got two nodes now one here and we have another node here and so this now has got one and a half wavelengths contained in the tube and you can see that we have the corresponding antinodes in between the nodes so we have three antinodes and four nodes one at either end and two in the middle and so this is showing that the standing wave conditions for a tube with two closed ends are consistent with what we would calculated. So now we've taken the plunger out of the tube and as you can hear the noise from the speaker at the end is a lot lot louder. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the frequency. Now we've tried this earlier and found that at the very low frequencies needed to excite the fundamental mode of this tube the speaker just simply doesn't have enough amplitude to make the cork dust move. So what we're going to do is we'll turn it up and will excite the first harmonic of the tube and so what we'll expect to see is a node at the end an anti-node about two-thirds of the way along the tube and then there'll be a node at the end of the tube and I'll warn you in advance this is going to get quite loud so here we go
Now, if you look carefully when I turn the volume back up again, you'll see that there's a node there, a distance of about two thirds along the tube from the speaker. So I'll turn it back up again, look carefully at that area, and you'll see that the cork there is not moving. So we've now seen standing waves both on this wave machine but also in strings and pipes and we've essentially now done the physics of music. Stringed instruments rely on standing waves in strings, woodwind and brass instruments rely on standing waves in pipes. But it turns out that standing waves are far, far more important to us than just music. They are, at a fundamental level, the reason why an electron energy in an atom is quantized. And so, therefore, the standing wave phenomenon is behind much of quantum mechanics, and we'll discuss that towards the end of the course. So, at a fundamental level, standing waves don't just give us music, they give us all of chemistry as well. So, we've almost now finished with our topic on waves. There's one last phenomenon to discuss, and that is what happens when the source or an observer is moving through the medium which transmits the waves. And this gives rise to the phenomena of Doppler shift, and we'll discuss that in the next video.